Hi everyone. So today we'll go over chapter 7S um, and topic we'll talk about is capacity and constraint management. An outline for this um, topic, we'll talk about capacity, bottleneck analysis, and theory of constraints, break-even analysis, reducing risk and uh, with the incremental changes, um, applying expected monetary value, EMV. Some of these topics we, we won't go in depth because uh, they're not actually in our syllabus, but some we'll spend a lot of time on, okay? Applying investment analysis to strategy-driven investments. Learning objective, so you will learn capacity, design capacity, effective capacity and utilization. <clears throat> we'll talk about bottleneck analysis and break-even value and determine the expected monetary value and net present value. So uh, the throughput or the number of units a facility can hold, receive, store, or produce in a period of time can be considered as capacity. It determines the fixed cost. Of course, not all of the fixed cost, but the major part of your fixed cost can be considered uh, under capacity and determines if demand will be satisfied. Uh, planning over time um, horizon. So if you want to go for a short range planning, so the question is, so here is saying options for adjusting capacity. If you want to adjust your capacity, uh, two ways you can do it, modifying your capacity or use the capacity, right? So modifying for short range, we don't do much of modifying. We um, use the capacity, schedule jobs, schedule personnel, allocate machinery. Uh, intermediate range planning, um, subcontracting, and add or sell equipment, add or reduce shifts. Uh, that's on our uh, modifying of the capacity side. On using capacity, build or use inventory, more or improve training, add or reduce personnel. And if you want to do a long-term or long-range planning, um, is more into modifying, right? Less into use capacity. So design new production process, add um, or sell existing long lead time equipments and acquire or sell facilities, acquire competitors. So what's the design and what is design capacity and what is effective capacity. So design capacity is the maximum theoretical output of a system. And that's where um, or what you actually design the system for, right? You can design a system to produce, for example, a hundred cars in a month. So that's what you designed it. But when it comes to actual work, when the machines start working, your employees start working, things can happen or restrictions can uh, show up that with these restrictions actually reduce what you design. You design for 100, you might be able to just satisfy 90 or 80 um, productions, right? So it's normally expressed as, expressed as a rate. Uh, what is effective capacity? That is the capacity a firm expects to achieve given uh, current operation, operating constraints. So there are operating constraints that any system of production, especially they have, and by considering them, those constraints, those limitations, uh, you will see that, oh, the design capacity cannot be met, so we have to reduce it to effective capacity. It's often lower than design capacity, or we can say is less than or equal to design capacity. Okay, so let's uh, look at one example here. So uh, let's look at machines at free to lay. So remember, 
Fifthly example from previous chapters are designed to produce 1,000 bags of chips per hour and the plant op operates 16 hours per day. So every hour we are supposed to produce 1,000 bags per hour. For how many hours the system is working? 16 hours. So we expect to, uh, on the design side, we expect to have 16,000 bags per day. If, we, if our mach machines, are, our system works 16 hours. So that's the design, right? Next, this, um, we have the effective capacity. So effective capacity occurs when you actually move forward um, and more details of your system shows up. So Frito-Lay loses three hours of output per day. The three hours is missed. When we move on, we will see that these things can happen. Half hour, in average, half hour per day on preventing maintenance. So for maintenance, you lose, uh, in average, half hour. One hour per day on employment breaks. So employment take a break and that um, let us lose one hour approximately. And one and a half hour per day setting up machines for different products. So um, they need to move or change um, the way that machines are connected or work. And that takes um, another one half hour. So one half hour here, one half hour here together, three hours is actually lost here, right? So 16,000 bags per day, which is based on design, minus every hour we are producing 1,000 times three hours that we're losing, that's 3,000. So re that reduces our production to 13,000 bags per day. What is that? Effective capacity. So effective capacity um, is calculated after you know your limitations, your your restrictions of um, your capacity. So the next thing is the actual output. So we learned um, about actual. Uh, we learned about the design capacity that we expect. Uh, we calculate on paper. We say, okay, using these machines, we can create this much product. And effective capacity with limitations uh, in the system. And then what in reality happens can be also different because even when we said three hours per day is wasted because of these cases, this three hours is based on some averages. It's not perfectly accurate. So sometimes can goes up to four hours, five hours or less or some things can happen that we have not uh, expected. Things like um, problems in electricity or breakdown, breakdown of a machine or damage to any part of uh, machines, right? So or maybe your su supplier uh, delays, right? These are the things that can happen and you, you may not be able to predict it or create a historical data to put it into effective capacity. As a result, um, reality is always real, actual output is actually different from what we expect and what we effectively would be produced. Okay, so actual output. Um, so here is saying on average machines at fatal A are not running one hour per day due to late parts and machine breakdowns. That's again in average. So if that information is given to us, we can also reduce another 1,000 bags, right, of chips. And that would reduce our actual to 12,000 bags per day. So we can see that how actual, um, actual output and effective uh, capacity and design capacity, how different they are. Now, let's define utilization and efficiency. What is utilization? Utilization is the percent of design capacity actually achieved. Percent design capacity actually achieved. So it's a, the formula is very simple. Actual output is saying actually achieved, right? Actual output 
divided by design. That's utilization. What portion of the design could you actually deliver, right? What portion of design capacity could you deliver? That's utilization. Then we also have um, efficiency. So efficiency is, and in this book is um, in fact defined as uh, the percent of effective capacity actually achieved. Effective capacity. So instead of design, we're using the effective. So effective capacity in the denominator. So what portion of effective capacity have we delivered, right? Actual output divided by, so both of them are actual output. For the utilization, we have, for the utilization, we have actual divided by design. For efficiency, we have actual divided by effective. So remember the difference between these two. Um, let's have an example now. Um, so for, for you to make sure you understand these um, numbers correctly, I expect you to have a piece of paper around you and just practice. Uh, make sure you have the same numbers. You calculate and make sure you get the same numbers. Um, that will help you to have a better understanding of all these numbers when once you have calculated yourself. So this question is giving us, giving us some information. Uh, actual production last week was uh, 148,000 rolls in a bakery. Effective capacity. So the, the basic or detailed information of the bakery may not be given in this case. In most problems, especially for exams, those small details are not given. You just get to know the, these numbers and you can easily calculate um, utilization and the rest, right? So effective capacity is 135,000 rows. Design capacity is 1,200 rows per hour. And for how long do they work? Um, and so you can see here, it says the bakery operates seven days per week. So they work every day, right? And how many hours per day? Three, eight hours. That means three, eight hours shift. That means 24 hours. So they're working 24 hours. But we know that they change their shift and uh, every eight hours we have a new team coming in. So 24 hours times seven days. Okay, so 1,200, so we have 24 times seven times 1,200 per, per hour. That would be 200, 1,600 um, rows. What is that? Design capacity. So the system is designed to produce 201,600 rows. Right? All right, so let's see what else we have. So the actual production last week, uh, after the week has ended, we can actually get this number, right? 148,000. Effective capacity, 175,000. And we already calculated 201,600 rows. So utilization was divided by design, right? Divided by design. So actual divided by design. So actual which is 148,000 divided by design, that would be 73.4%. So that's your utilization. That means what we actually produce is 73.4% of uh, what we designed for the system to produce, okay? So that's utilization. How about efficiency? Efficiency, instead of dividing by design, we divide by effective capacity. So we just need to change the denominator to 175,000, which is effective capacity given. So what's the efficiency of this system? 84.6%, 84.6%. All right, so now that you could calculate these numbers yourself, let's look at 
another, um, the same problem, but with another um, number. So let's say that, let's say the question tell you that uh, we have increased, or we decided to increase the design capacity uh, by two times. Design capacity by two times. So multiplied by two, that's 403,200. 403,200, right? Gross. Now, um, so this design capacity has doubled. What else? Let's say the effective capacity also has doubled. Effective capacity also has doubled. Right? And let's, let's say the um, question tells you that the expected output of new line is 130,000 rows. So what was the uh, the first week, the last week, actual values. Actual values from last week was 148 rows. Last week, the actual rows were 148. We doubled design and effective capacity. We doubled these two. And we can see that um, we calculated with some uh, probability in some um, previous weeks data from previous weeks, uh, we, we came up with this number, said that, okay, we have double design and eff effective capacity, but expected output, actual output, we don't expect them to be as much as previous week. We don't expect them to double as well. So the new line that we added, we expect them to have or produce less because these are two different lines. They don't have to necessarily produce exactly the same number of rows, right? So we calculate this number. Now, the question I have um, is that you can imagine you're a manager, you're, you, you have it, um, you're looking at your market and you see that there's more demand. So you decide to increase your capacity to two times and you also decide to have um, higher um, effective capacity, also by two times. Now, would you think or, or um, would you consider why, or would you say why the new line that we're adding could have less rows than the actual one from the last week? So these are two different lines. So we're adding a new line of production can you find or can you think of um, some reasons why the new line might have um, less rolls? Any? Okay, so with, with new numbers, our design has doubled our effective capacity has doubled, and our actual output is the sum of the two lines. Line one, the old one, uh, we expect it to still create the same amount of actual values, um, actual output of 148,000. The new line, let's say we expect it to produce 130,000, total is 278,000. So with these new numbers, you can actually recalculate the utilization and you can actually calculate efficiency, right? So utilization, 278,000, that's the sum of these two numbers of different lines, divide by the total of the design capacity, which is 403,200, and that's 68%, 68.95%. So, Compared to previous design, do we have a higher utilization or lower? So you can see that it has reduced, right? So same as what you learned and saw in previous uh, exam, in the next exams, you will have similar questions and the question will ask you, okay, is there an increase or is there a decrease in utilization? 
if there is an increase or decrease, how much is that? So you need to subtract the previous utilization and the current utilization. Efficiency, was were there any kind of increase or decrease? By what, what portion, what percent increase or decrease do we have by doubling our design capacity, okay? And of course, with the new design, uh, of course, we have reduced output, but by time moves on, uh, the system will learn to produce almost equal uh, for each line. And of course, you will have a higher utilization in long, long run, long term. Capacity and strategy. Uh, so capacity decisions impact all 10 decisions of operation management, as well as other functional areas of the organization. Capacity designs, capacity decisions uh, must be integrated into the organization's mission and strategy. Capacity considerations. So four things to consider, forecast, demand accurately. That's because if you don't forecast your demand accurately, you're going to have a design that produces more than what is actually is required or expected. And of course, you can't sell it. That would be a problem, right? So match technology increments and saves volume. Uh, find optimum operating size or the volume. So what we mean by optimum is we want um, we want to minimize our costs, where at the same time we want to have the maximum amount of profit. Uh, build for change. So I always expect changes. Um, and when you're building, when you're designing your system, design it in a way that you can increase your capacity or reduce your capacity if any um, anything happens in the, in the system. So economic, economies and these economies of scale. So you know that um, economically, when you increase the scale, you want to have more production, more production comes with a more cost. So can we say that by producing how, how thousand times or, or hundred thousand times more, you can actually make the same amount uh, more profit? So the answer is no, right? So you learned that in economic and you learned that um, this is your production line. So the more you want to produce, you're going to need more resources, more space. So this is an example of one case, number of square feet in a store, when that increases, that comes with the cost. So up to a certain point, the cost keep reducing when you are producing more. But after a certain point, that cost increases a lot. So that's not efficient for us. So we're always looking for that minimum point. There's a minimum point where your average unit cost compared to your scaling can be a square feet of a store, can be number of machines you take, number of employees you hire. All of these resources come with the cost. So there is a point that, that minimizes the cost, the total cost that you have. So that, that's the point we are actually always looking for. Managing demand. So managing demand is very important for production because if there's no demand, if you don't manage your demand, um, maybe make sure that stable demand, make sure that this is an increasing demand, or if you see any reduction in demand, you can control it and you can make sure it's comes back to the range that you are expecting, right? So demand exceeds the capacity. So that's not good because um, then you have customers and you don't have product to sell. It's not good for your reputation. Um, Character demand by raising prices, scheduling longer lead times. Or long-term long solution is to increase the capacity. So one way is to raise your prices. That actually reduces the demand going back to 
the demand that you actually expected. The other way is in the long term, you increase your capacity so that you can answer to that demand. <clears throat> uh, or maybe capacity exceeds demand, and that's not good, right? Because you're producing more than what is expected to be bought, and you, you will have leftover um, items. So you don't want to let that happen. So you can do more marketing and make sure that um, make sure you create more demand in the market and you can or you can ch make changes to your product so that people uh, buy uh, more of your product adjusting to seasonal demand seasonal demand you know that some products uh, people need them in a specific time of the year maybe two times or three times in the year but that has up and down. So those up and downs are, if they are happening annually, they're considered a seasonal demand. So like um, buying a skiing uh, products, right? Products that are related to cold weather or, or snows. And for those cases, um, you can sell those products when it's cold in, during the winter time, right? So it's very important that we adjust when the summertime comes and it's not cold anymore. People are less likely to buy those products. We reduce our product. When the winter comes, is back, we increase our product on those cases. So here we have an example of, so this uh, X axis is representing time in month. So January, February, March, up to December, Again, so this is for two years, right? January to another January up here. So you can see the red color is jet ski engine. So when when do they have increase in sales or in, in demand? You see that in March, April, down to June, July is good. And then after that, November, December, there is a reduction here. But compared to that. Snowmobile motor sales are inverse. So they're reduced during, they're increased during the cold weather, November, December, and they're reduced during the warmer parts of the year. Then when we go back to the cold, they increase, right? So that's, that's what we mean by seasonal. And if you are producing multiple items like this, so you can actually look at your combination of the two or three products at the same time. Tactics for matching capacity to demand. So making a staffing changes, reducing, increasing, or uh, providing training to increase or decrease uh, quality and uh, capacity of your system. Adjusting equipments, purchasing additional machines, um, selling or leasing out existing equipments, improving processes to increase throughput, uh, redesigning products for facilitate more throughput, adding process flexibility to make changing product preferences and closing facilities. There are different ways we can do it. So service sector demand and capacity management, demand management, uh, can be um, done by appointments, reservations, FCFS. Does anyone know what that is? F for first. First come, right? First serve. FCFS, first comes, first serve. Rule that will um, actually uh, push people to move faster to be the first so they can get the first step. Capacity management, um, on capacity management, we can talk about full-time temporary part-time staff. So a combination of these can actually help us with capacity management, especially part-timers are the ones that can actually very be, they, they can be very flexible and you have less commitment to them. So having them will help you to um, reduce or increase your capacity uh, with less cost. Next topic is 
bottleneck analysis and the theory of constraints. I'm, s I'm sure that uh, you have all seen bottleneck, um, special when you were driving to work, you're driving to school. Uh, so there are parts of um, the road that we go to go to work that couple of roads, they enter to a specific road at the same time. So that specific road is actually um, the traffic increases because different cars are coming from different directions and they all merge in one, one, one road, right? And normally if you check, you can see that um, the city or the, the government or the state, they decide to increase the, the bounds, number of uh, lanes in that um, part. But, but still you will see that uh, for those roads that are emerged from different roads, they are normally um, uh, having problem in traffic because uh, many cars come in at the same time, especially in the rush hour and there's a heavy traffic there, right? That heavy traffic, that's what we are talking about the bottleneck. So bottleneck is the part of the system where uh, because of some limitation or constraints, um, the, the effective capacity is actually very low. Uh, and always by recognizing that uh, bottleneck, we can, maybe we can double it or we can provide an alternative so that that bottleneck actually um, does not reduce the whole system's capacity, okay? So uh, a bottleneck is a, is a limiting factor or constraint, right? So a bottleneck has the lowest effective capacity in a system. The time to produce a unit or a specific specified batch size is the process time. So the process time is actually the time it takes for one, one product from raw material up to production goes out is actually um, taken to pr proceed. What's the bottleneck time? So bottleneck time is the time of the slowest workstation. There are different tasks. So these tasks are being completed, the lowest one is the bottleneck time. The one that takes the longest, right, in a production system. The, th the throughput time is the time it takes a unit to go through production from start to end with no waiting. So if, um, so, so why would we have waiting? Waiting happens when, for example, uh, it takes two minutes for the first production for first task to be completed and we go to the next task which is task B, but task B has four minutes per unit to process, right? So when task B is processing to complete its process in four minutes, task A is sending another output after two minutes. So when task B is in the middle of the work, task A has already sent out another production, another completed part, right? So that completed part comes here. It cannot be processed by B because B is in process, right? So that has to wait for two, another two minutes. So this four minutes completes, goes out, and the next comes in. So that waiting happens normally. That creates a queue, that creates a line, right? So there's a line here and because A is producing more than B in two minutes, B is processing in four minutes, so there will be a line here. If every case that comes out of A and is waiting in that line for being processed by B is in, in that waiting line. There's a time that in average they have to wait to be processed by B, right? That's, we, we are saying that let's cut and let's not consider that waiting time. If you don't consider that waiting time in the line, that's what we are talking about, the throughput time. So the throughput time is the time it takes a unit to go through production from start to end by excluding the time of waiting, okay? Um, capacity analysis, so two identical sandwiches lines. So this is an example here. 
that we have two lines. And look, when we have two lines that they can be um, working or processing at the same time. So the 15 second it takes per sandwich in the upper or first assembly line, and this 15 second per sandwich that is happening in the second assembly line, they can actually occur at exactly the same time. So when this happens, we don't count two times of 15 seconds, we count one of them, right? Because they can be done at the same time, right? So the same goes with the second fill, 20 seconds, toaster, 40 seconds. And at the end, we have a wrap deliver, right? So, so looking at this, um, you can probably think of which one can be a bottleneck here, which one can be a bottleneck here. Just think about it which of these tasks can be a bottleneck. So the one that takes longer to finish, right? The ones that it takes longer to finish or process, those are the ones. So it um, could be the toaster. Toaster could be a bottleneck here. So after order, after bread, after filling, then there will be a line here before we start the toaster, right? And because we have two toasters, and the processing time um, together actually is, is doubled. Um, I mean, number of production coming out from each is doubled, right? For the wrapping. Wrapping is also can be a bottleneck here, okay? So we need to consider um, to make sure we have, we can reduce the time of toaster and wrapping by increasing number of employees working there in that station. Um, or making changes to, to the machines or processes to automate things. So you can see the same information that I just said is actually explained here. And um, you can see that when it's calculating the throughput time, it's just adding this number 30 and then 15 and then 20 and then 40 and then 37. So it's not doubling these because there are double tasks here, right? It's not doubling it. You see that? It's just counting them one. Those that can be done concurrently, they are counted once in capacity analysis. And here it's saying about, uh, because the numbers we have here is, are in seconds, uh, is explaining um, capacity per hour is 3,600 um, seconds just multiply 60 by 60 uh, per 37 and a half second per sandwich. That's 96 sandwiches per hour. That's how we calculate for our hourly rate of producing sandwiches in average. Capacity, another capacity analysis here. So we can see first, second, and third part are back to back, but we have a concurrent task here but the difference between this example and previous example, if you check is on X-ray, it takes five minutes per unit to complete, but the hyg hygienist cleaning, it takes 24 minutes. So, so the question is when you are calculating the, the whole process, throughput process, which one should we consider or should we add them or subtract them, right? So look here, in this example that we had here, they're all exactly the same, 15, 15, 20, 20, 40, 40. But here, they are concurrent, but they have different timing. That means when the process gets to this point, the hygienist process takes 24 minutes, the x-ray takes five minutes. So at the same time that the hygienist is working, four, four times of x-ray exam is completed, but the hygienist hasn't completed yet, right? So then for the next step, you can see that uh, customers or processed items coming from x-ray exam, they are actually more than the hygienist cleaning part going to the dentist, right? So which one to, to consider? So you can see here, the x-ray exam, x-ray exam path will give you with the five minutes. 
the cleaning path will give you the 24 minutes. When you want, as a manager, when you want to consider which one to go for, you need to go for the one that is the maximum, right? The one that's the longest path. So that, that is the path you need to consider in your calculation. So the longest path involved hygiene is cleaning the teeth. Patients should um, complete in for six minutes. Okay, let's talk a little about the theory of constraints, five step, step process for recognizing and managing limitations. So first, you need to identify the constraints. Some constraints are uh, things that you can calculate when you're designing the system. Some will happen or will be recognized when the system starts working. Develop a plan for overcoming the constraints. Focus resources on, a, on accomplish, accomplishing step two. Reduce the effects on, um, reduce the effect of constraints by offloading work or expanding capacity. Once overcome, go back to step one and find new constraints. So um, if, if we don't really manage um, these constraints, What's, what can happen is, I'm sure you have seen, you, you go to a store, there is a very long line for people to pay, for example, and buy a product. So that line, long line um, exists, that long line exists because um, they did not do calculations correctly. They did not, they did not put enough uh, employees there to process the customers, right? So you don't want to let that happen. Why? Because sometimes people stay in that line and after some time they're saying, oh, it's not, it's not worth for me to waste my time and stay in line. Uh, or maybe they see another store is open they have the same product. They go there and buy it from there, right? So another thing that can happen is um, you're producing, so your whole production system have to wait for a specific task to be completed. If that is happening in your production system, of course, you need to increase number of your resources, increase number of machines in the bottleneck, increase number of employees in the bottleneck, and make sure that process is resolved and completed faster than uh, whatever it is now. Uh, release work orders system at the pace of set by bottleneck capacity. We just talked about it. Uh, lost time at the bottleneck represents lost capacity. So that's also what we just talked about it. Increasing the capacity of non-bottleneck stations is, is not really perfect. Uh, rather, you always need to find uh, the lowest um, effective capacity in the system and increase the capacity there. So start always with the minimum uh, capacity in every task you have, increase those, and then move forward to the ones that are not. Uh, none, they're not bottlenecks. Uh, increasing the capacity of bottleneck increases the capacity of the whole system. Okay, so next topic is break even analysis. All right, so the next topic is break even analysis. Um, Revenue function begins at the origin and proceeds upward to the right, increasing the increasing by the selling price of each unit. Uh, so you know that um, I'm, I'm sure you have learned break-even analysis in the past. You know what break-even point is. Break-even point is when you're producing and you're selling some products. Of course, there is a cost to it, right? There is a constant cost. Um, and also there is um, variable cost. So the variable cost is happening by each production, which item you produce um, to sell. So uh, let's say I'm producing pens, right? So for each one pen I add to my productions, there is additional cost to it, right? Plus um, there, there are certain costs that they're always there. So they never change. Uh, that's a fixed cost. So fixed cost plus 
uh, how many pr pr productions you have produced times um, the cost of each production or the variable, uh, variable cost will give you the total cost, right? So when you have that total cost, you're producing certain items. And these certain items, you're going to sell them with a certain price, right? With that certain price, when you sell those items, that money coming back to your hand is called revenue. So the question is, does that revenue after selling your items cover your costs? If that revenue is exactly equal to the cost that you have, that is your break even point. The question is how many productions, how many productions at a certain price should you produce and sell so that you can cover all of your costs? That means you're not making any profit, but you, ha you have no loss as well. So no loss, no profit. Revenue equals to um, cost. So why do we want to know the break-even point? We want to know the break-even point because we want to know at least, at least how many um, items we, sh we need to produce so that we can cover all of our costs. And of course, every additional unit you produce after break-even point or after the number of cases in your break-even analysis, every additional item you make, you're starting to make profit there, right? So again, revenue function um, is what you gain from selling your items at a certain price. Of course, if you increase your price, you will increase your revenue. Um, when revenue function crosses the total cost line, that is your break-even point. And that's what we just talked about. So this is a good um, figure on um, break-even point analysis. So you can see that there's a, there's a cost associated to the fixed cost plus. So this is, the fixed cost here is a 200, right? So it starts with a 200. Even if you don't produce anything, you still have to pay 200 for example, um, dollars, or if you think thousands, thousand dollars. Um, even if you don't produce anything, even if you don't sell anything, you still have that cost, right? So you can see that if you don't produce anything, there's a loss here, that's amount of loss. So you keep producing and increase your production up to a point where the cost and revenue, the dollar amount, Gain, gain from selling your items is equal to the cost that you have. After that point, your revenue is more than your cost and that's where you make profit. That's why it's very important for uh, any system, any service, any, any production companies to make sure they know where their break even point is. You never want to have um, values or number of production below your um, break-even point. And if your demand is below this point, then you need to do something for your market, marketing, making sure that make changes to your production or, or make sure you have more advertising, spend on advertising to increase your demand so that you can uh, sell more items. Okay, so, um, and you can see that this, um, the, slope of, the slope of your production line slope of your production line, um, that would be your uh, variable cost, right? And your fixed cost is fixed. Um, and one, one change, of course. There are assumptions we consider uh, when we're going through these formulas that you're going to learn today. And um, so sometimes when you see a formula, you might say to yourself, oh, why didn't we consider this or that fact? or this, this factor or this variable, why it's not included? Um, well, we're, we're assuming, we're having some assumptions here that those facts are uh, not exactly as what, what we assume, okay? So it's very important for us to understand that uh, some of these formulas are theoretical 
and they may not exactly match the reality. And in fact, uh, if we want to consider every factor that in production or in service happens, um, we will have a much more complicated formulas, okay? So we, to reduce that complication, especially um, the calculation can have higher range of error, can be more difficult. Um, it's, it's not easy to get those numbers all right. As a result, we are considering this assumption. So for those problems that we will solve in the future, cost and revenue are linear functions. Generally not the case in the real world, right? We actually know these costs, very difficult to verify. Time value of money is often ignored here, okay? So we, we can't, we're not going to say, uh, so if the question is saying during a year, uh, so if someone comes and say, but the money value, the value of the money is not the same during one year. So we, we assume that, um, the value of money is the same, it's constant. So what I want from you here is um, to have a, a piece of paper and pen or pencil and write down these formulas and try to make sure you understand them completely and ask me if you have any questions and I'll go over the formulas, okay? You, you do not need to memorize any of these formulas but it's very important on exams and homeworks that you recognize which formula is um, required to be used for which question, okay? It's the same as what you learned in the past. So what is BEP? BEP is break-even point. When you say BEP of X, X is the number of units produced. So X represents number of units, but of course when you are um, selling items, certain number of items, right, there is a, when you sell them, there is a dollar amount involved, or when price is involved, there's a dollar amount involved. So uh, that's a break-even point in dollars. So we can calculate break-even point both in units, how many units to produce to have break-even point, or what dollar amount to um, sell or revenue to create to have a break even point, right? So BP dollar is dollar amount, BPX is in units. <coughs> and what is the TR? TR is the total revenue. Of course, total revenue is, revenue is coming from selling items, right? How many items you have multiplied by uh, you have sold or you have to sell multiplied by the price of each, each item. That's your total revenue or TR. Price P, price per unit after all discounts, if there is any discount involved. F represents fixed cost. This is the cost that um, doesn't matter how many production you produce. If even if you produce zero, uh, items, you still have that fixed cost and you have to pay for it every month. Uh, variable cost. Sir, quick question. You said P times. All right, so what is V? Variable cost per unit. So for every one unit of production you increase, what's the cost to it? If you are producing, for example, um, a car, right? For every additional car you produce, What's the cost to that additional car you're producing? Of course, the, the uh, parts, of course, the labor, of course, um, a lot of other things that can be added there, right? What is TC? TC is the total cost, which is your fixed cost plus your variable cost, variable cost times number of units. Okay, so we have, we have all these definitions. Now it's time to look at the formula. How can we cal calculate, how can we calculate the BP of X or break even point in units? When you calculate that number, what does that mean? That means you have to produce this number of items so you break even. Does that make sense? So the formula is F, 
fixed cost divided by price minus variable cost. Fixed cost divided by price minus variable cost. Where did we get this formula from? From here. We know that at the break even point, the total revenue, TR, is equal to total cost. Because at break even point, your total cost is covered by your revenue, right? So they must be equal. In other words, we calculate each one separately. Total revenue is PX. Total cost is fixed cost plus variable cost times X, or number of items. And from here, you can actually solve this. This is an equation, linear equation. You solve this for X. So um, let me really quick show you how to make that calculation. So what we're saying here is, we're saying Px equal to F plus Vx. Px plus to fixed cost plus V times X. So X, you can see that X here is our variable, right? Our, um, the value you want to find it actually. The rest, we consider that the, we already know our price, we already know the fixed cost, we already know, let me take this here, we already know fixed cost, we already know variable cost. What we don't know is how many items should we produce, right? So you subtract both sides, this is a P, X minus VX, equals to F, right? I subtract VX from both sides, and then I factor, I can factor X here. So X stays out, what's left? P minus V times X equals to F. Right? In all of these, X is the variable. X is the one that we are going to find. That's why we wanted to isolate X. So this is how we did the isolation. Okay, so now what do we do? We divide both sides by P minus And that would give you the formula that you see there. X is equal to F divided by P minus V. I hope that makes sense to you. <coughs> so that's where this formula came from, okay? Just showed you how to calculate that formula. So, what you need to remember is the formula itself. You don't really need, of course, you need to know the fact that total revenue and total cost has to be the same when you're calculating your uh, break-even point. But what's the break-even point in numbers and units? F divided by P minus V. Very simple. So let's uh, move on. Now let's, um, calculate the same thing in, in dollars. So now we were going to, we want to calculate BP in dollars. So BP in dollars is number of units we produce that we just learned from the previous formula multiplied by the price. Is that right? So all we have to do is to multiply this by price. So this is the formula or in other words, you can actually uh, make a little change to this to make it more easier to understand. Um, so what we did here, this is a multiplication of P, right? F over P minus V that we just calculated in the previous slide times P price. Now, a multiplication can be also be divided by the reciprocal, right? So reciprocal of P is one over P so one over P is here, 
So you divided, divided this fraction by one over P. That's like multiplying with P. So that's how P goes down there. P divided by P one, V divided by P, V over P. So that's where the formula came from, okay? How about profit? What is profit? Profit is um, after break even point, when you produce more um, items than break even units, right? The difference between revenue, total revenue, and the total cost is your profit, right? So profit is the difference between total revenue and total cost. So we already calcu calculated the total revenue and the total cost before. So we have a PX as total re revenue, price of each item multiplied by how many items you produce, minus the cost, fixed cost and variable cost. So uh, the next step is just to simplify this. You can put the X's together, right? So the minus affects both in the parentheses, minus F minus VX. So that's P minus V times X minus F. That's how you can calculate your profit. If the question asks you, uh, if we want to produce, for example, this amount, What's the profit? Then we can talk about. All right, so in this example, which is for the break even example, let's say that the fixed cost is $10,000. And what I want from you is to um, have a paper and a pen and just um, have a calculator as well and uh, perform the calculations yourself. Make sure you can get the same numbers, uh, especially by rounding and make sure you, the order of operations is done correctly so you get to practice the calculation. Um, sometimes this happens when you feel very confident about using your calculator, but during exam, you will see that the number you find in using the calculator is not same as the number you get from um, the box, so make sure you have the same calculation, okay? So it's saying the fixed cost is $10,000. Material per unit, so that's variable cost, right? Part of variable cost is a material per unit, $0.75 um, dollar or 75 cents. Direct labor, every unit that you produce, there is another variable cost, which is one and a half dollar um, labor or employees. So together, what's the variable cost? Together is 0.75 plus one and a half. That's uh, 2.25, right? 2.25 dollars is your variable cost. And the formula is fixed cost divided by one minus V over P. So fixed cost 10,000 divided by one minus. So your variable cost V is the sum of different variables, variable costs, which is 2.25 divided by four. What is four? Four is your selling price or, or P price. Again, make sure you calculate this yourself. So I recommend you uh, start from the inner, inner parentheses or inner brackets. Calculate this part first, subtract it from one, separately have it, then divide 10,000 by the number you find. And 10,000 divided by 0.4375 is 22,857.14. So what is this number? This number is how much you make after producing at break even um, units. So you're producing break even amount of units and you're selling it at a certain price, how much do you make? 22,857.14. That is also equal to your um, total uh, your total cost, right? Okay, so let's see what we have here. So we uh, just did the calculation for BP in dollars. So let's see what is the BP 
number of units. How many should we produce and sell to have break-even point? So break-even point of x is f over p minus v. We have the numbers, we have the formula. All you have to do is to substitute the value. So fixed cost, $10,000. Price per unit, $4. Variable cost, one plus point, one and a half plus 0.75. Subtract them, divide, you should get 5,714 units. So you need at least 5,714 units to break even for such problem, okay? The problem that that's your variable cost, that's your fixed cost, and um, that's your selling price. So. If this number was a, was a decimal with a decimal, was not rounded, when you calculate it, always round up. Even if it was like 5713.1, round it up because you don't want to have any loss, right? You, you want to make sure that you have enough, you have uh, made enough um, revenue to cover all of your costs. Okay, so that's uh, for, for the same problem, right? So you can see that it shows in the system. Now for that problem, um, we only had um, one production, right? The question is, if you have multi-productions, multiple productions, a multi-product case, um, how, how should we calculate complete the calculations, how to perform the calculations. So there's a formula here. So I want you to spend like a few minutes to look at this formula, understand it, so we can move forward with this formula to the next example. So again, F is your fixed cost. And sigma means the sum. So what else is I? I index the I index is for each production. If you have five different productions, then when you substitute I for one, that would be production one. One minus variable cost of production one, price of production one times the weight. And what is weight? Weight is the percent of each product is total dollar sale expressed as a decimal percent each product is of total dollar sales, right? What portion of the total sales is that product? That would be W. So for production one, calculate it, plus I2, production two, calculate the same number for production two, plus. So the denominator is the sum of same calculation for different productions. If you have five, five productions, for each production, you need to calculate this denominator one time separately, and then add them. That's your denominator. Numerator is F, and you just divide at the end. That would give you your break-even point in dollars, okay? So I hope you already wrote down this formula, and you're ready to see an example. Okay, so this is a good example. Um, pay attention carefully. And what I recommend you, this example is actually in the book as well. So all you have to do is to, after class, um, today or tomorrow at least, I mean tonight maybe you're tired, but at least tomorrow, um, don't, don't let it uh, until the next week because you will forget this. So I want you to read this from the book. When you read this from the book, read it carefully make sure you understand this problem and redo it one time, uh, just to make sure you're comfortable with the numbers because this can become, this is actually very easy, but it can become very confusing if you forget it or if you don't pay attention, okay? So what do we have here? We have three items uh, that we are producing, sandwiches, we have drink, and we have baked potato. Each one come with a certain cost and a price, cost for each one and a price of each one. And 
annual forecasted sales unit. Why do we have the annual forecasted sales unit? Because we want to know how many of them should we uh, produce at least, right? So sandwich, we can see it's um, 9,000. That's the forecast per unit. And then we have the selling price, $5. We have the variable cost, $3. So these are all given to you, okay? Up to this point, you have no problem. These numbers are all given to you. What you need to calculate is to calculate that formula. Look at the formula. Again, I ask you, please write this down on a paper. So when we're down there, you can actually just look at it and see what's happening. So first we're calculating the VI over PI, V over P, variable cost over price, and then subtract it from one. Look, you see here, V divided by P. We just, we just divide three over five, 0.6. Half over one and a half, 0.33. One over two, 0.5. Does it make sense? The next step is just from these numbers that we just calculated on five, column five, we calculate column six, and that's just subtract from one. 0.6, one minus 0 0.6, 0 0.4. One minus 0 0.33, 0 0.0, approximately 0 0.67. One minus 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So these numbers, they easily, they were easily calculated by um, subtracting them from one, right? And what's the next step? Annual forecasted sales in dollars. So what do we do here? We know that annual forecasted demand here is uh, 9,000 units. At what price? At what price are we selling this? It's right here, $5. Nine times five, nine times five, 45. Thousand, thousand, right? Very simple. Nine thousand times one and a half, thirteen thousand five hundred. Seven thousand units times two, two dollars, that's fourteen dollars. So you can see that these numbers are actually calculated very easily, right? You just need to remember the formula, which is this one, and just substitute these numbers. Substitute the numbers, calculate this, calculate this, and next step is calculating WI. How do we calculate WI? One more time. Percent of each product is of total dollar sale. So we need to calculate the total dollar sale, and that would be our denominator for w, calculating the W. And on the numerator, we have the sale of each product. What portion of the total product? total sale is uh, sale of each item. So item one, let's see. So this is the total, right? 45,000. So percent of sale. What's the total say? 72,500. So the 45,000, can you do it on your calculator? Right now, do it on your calculator each of these sales amount for each production divided by the total sale. 45,000 divided by 72,500. Divide it please. <coughs> I'll do it here too, so we can see. It. I use my calculator from here, so you can see it right there. Let's see one more time. That's um, 45,000 divided by 72,000. 45, it's too big. 45,000 divided by 72,500. 72,500. Just divide it equals to 0.62, right? 0.62, do we have the same number here? 0.621, do you see it? So it's very easy 
we just calculate the total sale and sale of total sale of each item divided by the total sale that would give you the WI. So you have the WIs, you have the one minus VI PI. Going back to that formula, you already calculated it, this one for each item. You calculate the WR for each item, multiply them. For each item, multiply them and then add the multiples. That's very easy. So what we do here is, um, so we have the WI, we have the one minus VI PI. You just multiply. 0.40 times 0 0.621, 0 0.40 times 0 0.621, that would give you 0.248. Let me just show you really quick here, see if we have that correct. So let me clear this. And we have, let me show the camera completely. So we have 0.4. 0.4 times 0.621. This should be 0 0.2484. 0 0.248. It's rounded to three decimals, right? And then how about the next one? 0 0.186. 0 0.1. 86 multiplied by. 0 0.125, 0 0.125, oops, 25. Is, oh, is that right? I think I did the wrong one. 0 0.67, 0 0.67 times, times 0 0.8, 0 0.186, times, Sixty-seven times point one eight six, and that's one point twenty-five. One point twenty-five, right? It's rounded. And the last one, point zero ninety-seven, point five times times point one nine three. You calculate it, you will get the same number, and then add them up. When you add them up. That's not the answer. That's your denominator. What's the numerator? Numerator is the fixed cost. That's your break even point in dollars. With your fixed cost, three different items that you have. Okay, so daily sales is also calculated. And the fixed cost, so we, we need to multiply it by 12 because I didn't see that part. So it's saying this is per month. All these numbers we were calculating were in years. So you need to multiply the 3000 by 12. So you need to multiply this by 12 and then divide it by 0.47. So let me really quick one more time. So 12 times 3000. and then divide it by <clears throat> 0 0.47. which is rounded to nine, um, six. Here's nine, five, here's nine, six. So it's just rounded up, All right? And then you divide that by how many days in a year they're working. Actually calculate the daily set. Divide it by number of day, days in a year that they work. So every day they need to make $245 and a half to um, break even.